So let's talk about some of the other symptoms of gluten exposure in the oral cavity. So in this diagram here, we said this before, these are, these are symptoms of, we'll just draw it in, of gluten mouth exposure. So number one is gingivitis, inflammation of the gums directly. And so this gingivitis, as the gums are inflamed, they'll start to recede. That's going to make it easier for your, for your teeth to begin to decay. Gingivitis is kind of the earlier symptoms associated with, with tooth loss coming your way. We know that, as I mentioned a minute ago, we know that bacterial changes can occur with the consumption of gluten in the mouth. And so some of those bacterial changes will dry out the mouth or will start to create problems associated with, um, with enamel. This is going over here with enamel issues around the teeth as well. And I'll show you, actually, let's just go ahead and pull that up. Um, let's talk about some enamel defects and show you some pictures where you can really see what this kind of looks like. So in this diagram, this was actually published in the Journal uh, of the Canadian Dental Association. These are just images of what grade one through four uh, enamel defects look like. So you can see in this case, in the grade one, the enamel defects, multiple white and cream opacities you can see on the teeth directly. Now, these are pediatric teeth. You can do these are children. In adults, this can look very similar, but you won't have the jagged ridges uh, on the base of the teeth. Now, in figure two, you can see grade two enamel defects, rough enamel with surface with patchy symmetric opacities and discoloration. So if you kind of zoom in on that, you can see some of the patchiness in the wider areas of the teeth starting to occur. And then we have grade three, which really starts, you can really start to see in it showing up and you've got these, dis, dis, these linear components running across the center of the tooth. Let's back that out and move that out of the way so you can see it. But, um, but again, this is, this is quite severe. You don't want it to get to this point. This is, you know, when your enamel goes, then your, then your cavities or your caries can really start to form. And then this final picture, you can see this is the tongue here. This is the lower teeth. And then you have right here that I'm circling, that is an aphthous ulcer. So an internal ulcer on the side of the cheek. This is another common manifestation of gluten sensitivity in the mouth. So if you ever had fever blisters inside your mouth, these are called, also called aphthous ulcers. If you've got, ever had fever blisters around your mouth, canker sores, if you will, on the lips or around the corners of the lips, these can all be manifestations of gluten exposure orally. Now, a lot of doctors will say, okay, if you've got canker sores or aphthous ulcers, they'll blame this on a virus, right? The herpes family of viruses uh, usually are the culprit or the blame to, for this. But I have seen countless cases of this type of problem go away in people going on a gluten-free diet. So this is very, very common to see aphthous ulcers that are chronic. And so if you struggle a lot with mouth sores, aphthous ulcers, canker sores, going on a gluten-free diet might just be the thing that you need to do uh, to clear that up. And, and again, if you struggle with that and you've always just been told it's a virus, think twice, get checked for gluten sensitivity because you may not have a virus at all. You may indeed be eating the wrong food. And so that, that's down here again, mouth ulcers and canker sores, manifestation of gluten sensitivity in the mouth. I mentioned this a number of times, xerostomia, which is dry mouth, is very common. There's actually a disease called Sjogren's. Sjogren's is an autoimmune disease, um, and it manifests as dry mouth, dry eyes, and tear ducts. So it manifests not just with a dry mouth. So if you struggle with dry eyes, dry tear ducts, dry uh, mouth simultaneously, you might just ask your doctor to check you for this. Now there's a gluten association with this condition as well, meaning this is an autoimmune disease. We know gluten can contribute to the development of it. And this is why, or one of the reasons why dry mouth uh, is, is common to develop. And then tonsil stones are another one. And so tonsil stones, lead to bad breath. So if you've got chronic halitosis, you don't know why, you brush your teeth on a regular basis uh, and you just can't figure out why that's happening, tonsil stones just may be the reason as to, uh, as to why that's happening. I'm gonna blow this picture up for you because I want you to get a good idea of what tonsil stones look like. So as you're in the, uh, in the mirror, 
in, the, in the bathroom, you could kind of see. So obviously this is the tongue, the top of the lip here, and then just back in the tonsils, you'll see these white patches. Okay, they'll form just like that, and they look like little white splotchy patches. Um, I'm going to get that out of the way so you can see it again. But these are called tonsil stones, or otherwise known as tonsillar exudate. And very important, if you have these chronically, this is a hallmark of gluten exposure. What are the tonsils? The tonsils are the adenoids. What do they do? The tonsils are immune tissue. So, how is it that tonsils, uh, tonsil stones can form with gluten exposure? They form as a result or as a direct result of the food itself. So the gluten stimulates the immune system. Your body doesn't like the gluten. So your tonsils are, are the first line of defense in your immune system. So as you eat that gluten, your body, your immune system is sequestering white blood cells to the tonsils. It's sequestering them to help fight what you're eating. And so what happens is you get pus and debris basically embedding into the crypts of your tonsils. This is because there's an immune battle constantly going on between you and your food. That's why it stinks because it's basically it's, it's pus and immune system debris that packs into the tonsils itself. And so that's why it causes that chronic bad breath or the chronic halitosis. So if you have gluten exposure, uh, and you are, let me reframe that, let's say you eat gluten and you don't even know that you're gluten sensitive, but you chronically struggle with bad breath as a result of tonsil stones, you might consider gluten sensitivity as the reason that that's happening and get that looked at or get that checked at. And as you've heard me talk about in the past, you know, the best way to check for gluten sensitivity is not a blood test. The best way to check for gluten sensitivity is to do a genetic test. So again, if you don't know, it's best to get tested so that you can get, uh, get it figured out. Now, I wanted to show you this too. This is a review, a literature, a literature review. So this is a medical review of the medical literature and it was done by predominantly dentists and published in, uh, in pediatric, pediatric dentistry. So you can see here the results. According to some literature studies, prevalence of enamel defects and recurrent aptus stomatitis. What is that, aptus stomatitis? This is inflammation and the corners or the cracks of the lips was observed in approximately 10 to 96 percent. Um, and this is of two to 86 year old celiac patients. So chronic aptus stomatitis was observed in up to 96 percent of patients with celiac disease ranging from ages two to 86. And then the um, recurrent aptus Rather, the, I'm um, sorry, the enamel defects, I, I, I read that backwards to you. The enamel defects were present in 10 to 96% of the individuals, and the recurrent aptus stomatitis was present in 4 to 41% of the individuals in the age range in this study, or in this grouping of studies of research, was 2 to 86 years of age. So point being, again, these are major problems that are found highly prevalent in celiac but also in children without celiac disease, you can see the conclusion of this study, the presence, okay, uh, was of, okay, let me back that up. The presence of these clinical features in children may signal the need for early investigation of possible celiac, um, especially in asymptomatic cases, meaning sometimes these are the only symptoms that can occur. So if you've got children that struggle with mouth ulcers or mouth sores, if you've got children that struggle um, with stomatitis, the cracking of the lips, etc., is something to consider. Again, check your children too for tonsil stones. Uh, not a lot of research on this one. There's a ton of research on, on the other things I've talked about tonight. Tonsil stones, uh, there may be a few small scale case studies that have been published in the literature. I actually have uh, probably a couple of dozen uh, within my own practice that I have seen go away as a result of this. So it's again, it's not uncommon to see this go away in terms of uh, going on a gluten-free diet. So very, very important that if you've got or struggle with those issues, that you're suspecting gluten as a potential culprit. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.